Amen. All you can say is thank you, Lord, for the talent that you have blessed us with in this church. Amen. Amen. From those who sing to our musicians, praise the Lord. Let's bow in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, the words of that song are so true. God, not for one moment have you ever forsaken us. You are sovereign and perfectly good in all that you do. And Lord, I'm thankful that you are our God. I'm thankful that you are our Father. And I'm thankful that you pursued us. Thank you for making salvation available through the death, burial, and resurrection of your Son. Thank you for the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit. And Heavenly Father, I pray that right now you would receive all the glory and all the praise as your word is preached. That we would listen and that we would honestly evaluate ourselves, that we would allow your Holy Spirit to examine our hearts and reveal truth to us, not to hurt us, Lord, but to make us better. And so, Lord, may we receive the Word of God this morning as the Word of God and not as a Word of man. Lord, we believe, we say together that we believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and we pray for His freedom, for His power to work powerfully in our presence today. May he have freedom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, some of you know a little bit about my past history before going into the ministry. Um, as a matter of fact, I was working for the railroad at the time that the Lord saved me. And at the time the Lord called me into the ministry, I started out as a brakeman and was a student engineer. In other words, I was... You had to have 120 hours of, of locomotive time of running the locomotive yourself before you could be certified as a locomotive engineer. And so I was a, an apprentice, if you will. I was, I was in training. And I can remember one day in particular, we were bringing a train in from Medill, from Medill to Hugo, Oklahoma. And as we, were, as we were coming into Hugo, there's a sharp curve, and then you begin to head downhill. Now, that day, we were pulling, and I want you to hear this, we were pulling a 109-card a loaded grain train full of corn. It was very heavy. And as we were coming into Hugo, we were doing, uh, we were only doing about 30 miles an, hour, miles an hour as we were coming in, and all of a sudden, all the air, all the air in the train just blew out. Just all the air. It's called big holing. The train just big hold. All the air just shot out of it. Now, when all the air shoots out of the train, that means all the brakes lock up. Okay? And so the train big hold, we didn't do it. It did it on its own. And I looked at the guy that was with me, and both of us knew that that wasn't a good sign. <laughs> we looked behind us, and everything looked okay. We tried to build the air back up, but it wouldn't build up. That means that there's an obvious leak somewhere if it will not build pressure back up. So I got out, and I walked, and I started walking 109 cars of grain, looking at each one to make sure an air hose maybe didn't come uncoupled. Everything looked fine until I reached the last nine cars of the train. And every car, the last nine, they were all turned on their side, and there was corn everywhere. There were railroad ties sticking up in the air. There was, there was, the rail was sticking up. I mean, it was just a mess back there. And what had happened as we were coming around that curve, the weight of that train pushed the rail out, and the last nine cars derailed, and it was a total mess. It took weeks to clean that mess up. Now, the reason I'm sharing that story with you is because anytime you have a derailment or a wreck where if you run into somebody at a crossing, they have a black box on those locomotives. And they'll pull those black boxes to see how you were running the locomotive. Were you doing what you were supposed to do? In other words, they evaluate you. Now, praise be to God. We were doing everything right as they pulled the black box and, and did the evaluation, but we were sweating. 
during that time, and they came back and they said, okay, it was not engineer failure, uh, failure. It, was a, it was a problem in the track, and so we were good. Now, here's the reason I bring that up, is because we had to undergo an evaluation. This morning, I want to have a little bit of fun with this sermon. And I want you to undergo an evaluation. And by the way, every sermon that we hear, we ought to be evaluating ourselves, right? But this Sunday, I've actually given you a test at, on the back of your bulletin. And I know some of you don't like filling out your bulletin, and that's okay. Uh, if you don't like filling it out, you, you don't hurt my feelings at all, all right? But this morning, I'm going to ask that you participate. Because what we are going to evaluate is your attitude. And not only your attitude personally, but we're also going to evaluate the attitude of your connection group. Now, for those of you who may be guests with us here today, you may say or be thinking to yourself, what is a connection group? Well, a connection group is just another way of saying Sunday school or small group, Bible study. And so I want you to evaluate, I want to make sure you get this, I want you to evaluate your, your, your attitude personally and then I want you to evaluate the attitude of the connection group that you're a part of, okay? Now, this morning's sermon is entitled Evangelistic Evaluation. And so if you would open your Bibles there to Acts chapter 11 as we continue to make our way through the book of Acts. Last week, believe it or not, I was able to preach a whole chapter. And you still got to your connection groups on time, amen? Miracles do happen. Well, I'm, I've, I've, I've got the big head now, so now I'm going to preach another chapter, all right? So we're, we're going to look at all of chapter 11 today. And as we work our way through chapter 11, what we're going to do is I want to make sure that we get a grasp of what's going on in the chapter, as always. So we're going to walk through the narrative. We're going to make some, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to draw some truths out. And then towards the end of the message, I'm really going to challenge us in the area of this evaluation, okay? But let's make sure that we understand what's going on in the chapter, first of all. Now, let me let you in on something. As we work our way through this chapter, I want you to pay attention to the attitudes of the people that we encounter, right? I want you to pay attention to the attitude of the first century church. So the first thing that we see here is remember in chapter 10, chapter 10, Peter has just gone to Caesarea... And shared the gospel with Cornelius. Cornelius is a Roman centurion. A man in a very influential position. But the thing about Cornelius is Cornelius is a Gentile. And so far, all through the beginning of Acts, as we looked at Acts chapter 1, all the way up through Acts chapter 9, the gospel has not been given to the Gentiles. The gospel has been for the Jew. But God reveals to Peter in a vision that the Jews are not to see the Gentiles as unclean. But the gospel is to go to the Gentiles as well. And so Peter goes to Cornelius' home. He shares the gospel. Cornelius is saved. Those there in his household are saved. And so in, and so in, in Acts chapter 10, we see the gospel going beyond the Jews to the Gentiles, and we see Gentile conversion. Now, the question that we would have to ask is, what does the Jerusalem church think about this? How does the Jerusalem church respond when they find out that Gentiles are being saved or that Peter went to the Gentiles and had dinner with them? Well, the Bible tells us, look there, Acts chapter 11, verse 1. So the church in Jerusalem finds out about Peter going to the Gentiles, and they're a little upset. Not because they hate the Gentiles, but because up to this point, they, they feel as though the gospel is just for the Jews. And so they question Peter. Verse 1, the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had welcomed God's message. And when Peter went up to Jerusalem, those who stressed circumcision, in other words, those, who, those Jews who believed that circumcision was a prerequisite to salvation, they argued with him, saying... You visited uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter, now here, here's the picture. Peter is one of the fathers of this movement. One of the apostles. One of the, one of the twelve responsible for taking the gospel to the Jews. And now the Jews find out that Peter is having supper with the Gentiles. So in the mind of the Jew, this is going to hurt 
the progress of the gospel in the Jewish nation. The Jew is thinking in their mind, wait a minute, God came to save the Jews. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, before Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, what did he tell his church? You shall be my witnesses in, Ju in Jerusalem. Yes, he said Judea, Samaria, and to the other most parts of the earth. But these believers in Jerusalem were saying, wait a minute. Peter, you're going to the Gentiles, but Jesus told us to start in Jerusalem. So it's not that they hated the Gentiles. They just felt like Peter was being disobedient to the commission that Christ gave. And they feel like that this is going to hinder the cause of Christ among the Jewish people. And so for this reason, they bring Peter in. They question Peter. And then we see in verse 4 that Peter begins his argument. Starting there in verse 4, Peter begins to explain to them about the vision that he received from the Lord in chapter 10. Just a little bit about that vision. In chapter 10, as Peter was up on the house praying, the Lord revealed to Peter in a, in a vision that the Gentiles are no longer to be seen as unclean. The vision took place in this way. God lowered a sheet down from heaven. And on this sheet were kosher animals and non-kosher animals. And God says, God says to Peter, take and eat. And Peter looks at all these non-kosher uh, animals and he says, No, Lord, I have never eaten anything unclean. I will not eat. And the Lord responds to Peter and says, Don't call, call anything unclean that I have made clean. Now at that point, Peter did not understand the vision. Until later, some dispatched messengers from Cornelius come to Peter and they say, Hey, our master wants to speak with you. And so Peter follows. He goes to the home of Cornelius, and now the vision makes sense. And so Peter tells them this. Listen, God revealed to me in a vision that the gospel is not just for the Jew. The gospel is for the Gentile. The people listen. The church in Jerusalem, they listen to, Paul's, I mean, to Peter's argument. Now I want you to look at verse 10. Now this happened three times as he's talking about the vision, and then everything was drawn up into heaven again. And at that very moment, three men who had been sent from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. And now Peter's still explaining the vision. Then the Spirit told me to go with them with no doubts at all. These six brothers accompanied me, and we went to the men's house. We reported, he reported to us how he had seen an angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and call for Simon, who is also called Peter, and we will speak words to you by which you and all your household will be saved. And Peter continues to talk about what happened. He says, verse 15, as I begin to speak, the Holy Spirit came down on them just as at the beginning, as he did with us on the day of Pentecost. And then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave them the same gift that he also gave us when we believed the Lord Jesus Christ, how could I possibly hinder God? Now notice their attitude, verse 18. When they heard this, they became silent. Then they glorified God, saying, So God has granted repentance, resulting in life even to the Gentiles. So I want you to stop for a moment. When the church in Jerusalem heard about Gentiles being saved, when they heard about Peter going to the Gentiles, they were very disturbed, as I told you before, because they thought that this would be a hindrance to the gospel in relation to the nation of Israel. So they begin to question Peter and accuse Peter, basically, as critics of being disobedient to God. Peter says, wait a minute. He tells them about how God revealed to him in a vision how he was to go to the Gentiles. And then Peter tells them, listen, they received the Holy Spirit just like we did. I mean, on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit came upon us and we spoke in other tongues, the same thing happened to them. When the Gentiles heard the gospel and they received the gospel, the Holy Spirit came upon them as, as well. And they too spoke in other tongues. And when the Jerusalem church heard this, when the Jews in Jerusalem heard Paul's, I'm sorry, I keep saying Paul. When they heard Peter's testimony, when they heard Peter's testimony, how did they respond? They glorified God 
Because now they realize that salvation was not only for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. Here's what I want you to notice, is that they accepted the Gentiles. They accepted them. Now, I'm not ready for you to fill in your blanks yet or take the test, but I just want, to, I just want you to get a, a grasp of their attitude. They had a problem with it at first, but once they knew it was of God, the Jews embraced the Gentiles here in this passage of Scripture. Now we move on to verse 19, and it says, Those who had been scattered as a result of persecution because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking to no one except the Jews. But there were some of them, Cypriot and Cyrenian men, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Hellenists, in other words, to the true Greeks, the Gentiles, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. Verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Then the report about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. And when he had arrived, he saw the grace of God, and he was glad. And notice here, notice what he does. He encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord and with a firm resolve of heart. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a large number of people were added to the Lord. Then he went to Tarsus to search for Saul, and he found him, and he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year he met with the church and taught large numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So now Gentile salvation breaks out in Antioch. Now Gentiles are being saved in Antioch. So the Jerusalem church hears about it once again. And the church in Jerusalem, they send Barnabas to check it out. Why do you think they sent Barnabas? They could have sent anybody. Why did they send Barnabas? Because Barnabas was known as the encourager. So Barnabas goes. He arrives in Antioch. He sees the salvation of these Gentiles. And how does Barnabas respond? What's Barnabas' attitude? He encourages them. He encourages them. He encourages them in the Lord to remain faithful and to remain steadfast and resolute of heart. So we see an attitude of acceptance and we see an attitude of encouragement. And now we move on and now notice these new Christians. Notice what these new Christians do in verse 27. In those days, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine throughout the Roman world and this took place during the time of Claudius. So each of the disciples, these are the new converts in Antioch. So each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brothers who lived in Judea. This they did, sending it to the elders by the means of Barnabas and Saul. So Agabus the prophet arrives there in Antioch. And he prophesies that there's going to be a severe famine in Judea. So you know what the church in Antioch does? They take up a love offering, <laughs> a relief fund, in order to take care of the Jerusalem church. So we see them supporting one another. We see an attitude of support. We see an attitude of acceptance. The Jews accept the Gentiles. We see an attitude of encouragement. Barnabas encourages the new believers. And then we see an attitude of support because the new, the new believers are now actively involved in helping the church to thrive. You'll notice there on your notes that this I, I've written a little sentence there that says, This morning I want you to evaluate your attitude towards others by, uh, by scoring yourself based upon the five following questions. Notice a number one means not at all. A number two means very rarely. A number three means half the time. Number four, most of the time. And number five, all the time. You're going to score yourself in two different areas. If you're not a part of a connection group, um, then you're going to score yourself in one area. Okay? The first area is you personally. Second area is the attitude of your connection group. When we come to Acts chapter 11, and really not just Acts chapter 11, but throughout the book of Acts, what is the attitude of the early church? They had an attitude of evangelism. Would you agree with that? 
They had an attitude of evangelism. Everywhere they went, they, they shared the gospel. Their heart's desire was to see people saved. So the first question, do you have an attitude of evangelism? Do you have an evangelizing attitude? And I want you to be honest. And I don't want you to cheat off somebody else's, all right? Okay. But I want you to be very honest about yourself, and I want you to be very honest about your connection group. It is very important that you're honest. The Holy Spirit is watching you, okay? So do you have an evangelizing attitude? Do you have an evangelizing attitude? Do you, are you constantly thinking about ways, creative ways, to share the gospel with people? Are you praying for people who are lost? Last week when we gave you the opportunity to do something very simple and to put your testimony online, did you take advantage of that? I'm not saying that you have to share the gospel the way I do, but do you have, are you looking for ways to be evangelistic? So do you have an evangelizing attitude? Score yourself. Not at all, maybe some of you would say. Some of you would have to say very rarely. Some of you would say, well, half the time. Could you say most of the time? Could you say all the time? Because the early church did. They had an evangelizing attitude. Their heart's desire was to see people saved. So have you scored yourself personally? Now I want you to score your connection group. Does your connection group have an evangelizing attitude? What is your connection group doing to reach new people with the gospel? Would you characterize your connection group as evangelistic? Are you praying for the lost? Are you going out and visiting prospects? Are you participating in church outreach events? So score your connection group. Be honest. Second question, do you have an embracing attitude? Do you have an embracing attitude? Well, here in Acts chapter 11, I, I just shared with you that when the Jews heard the testimony of the Gentile conversion and they heard it explained by Peter, what, how did they respond? They embraced the Gentiles. The Bible said, as a matter of fact, it says there in verse 18, when they heard this, they became silent. Then they glorified God, saying, God has granted repentance, resulting in life even to the Gentiles. So you personally, do you have an embracing attitude? Are you accepting of other people who look different than you, who dress different than you, who talk different than you, who have different color skin than you have, who make less money or more money than you? Are you accepting of people? Do you have an, an embracing attitude? Are there certain people that you like to be around and other people that you don't? Are there certain groups of people that you're drawn to and other groups of people that you seek to avoid? Do you have an embracing attitude? Now, I believe that there's something that we can learn from all people. I want to show you a picture, not to promote theology, but to just to give you a great example of, of an embracing attitude. I came across this picture this week. Put it on the screen. I came across this, this picture this week on the Internet. Look at that. That's the Pope. Yes, I will say that we have some major theological differences with the Catholic Church, okay? We're not promoting theology. But I want you to look at his embracing attitude. There is a man covered in tumors. If that man walked into your connection group this morning, how would you respond? If that person was sitting in, in your pew, okay, how would you respond? Would you go ahead and sit down? Would you go out of your way to welcome this person and to embrace this person and to encourage this person and to love this person in the name of Jesus? Or would you seek to avoid this person? You can go ahead and take that down. 
Now, I know we would say, well, pastor, that's an extreme, but I believe it makes the point that I want to make. I want to know, do you have an embracing attitude? Are, are there certain people that you think you're better than? What about your connection? Score yourself. What about your connection group? Does your connection group have an embracing attitude? When new guests come into your connection group, are they embraced? Do they feel welcome? Do they feel like they're a part? Or has your connection group become a clique? All of our connection groups are meant to be open. You know what that means? That means that anybody could come in at any time and be a part of a community, be a part of a family, be a part of a fellowship. But if we're not careful, you know what will happen? Your connection group will no longer be open. It will become closed. You want to know whether or not you have a closed connection group or an open connection group? Do you have new people joining? Do you see new faces in your connection group? Or have you been meeting with the same people for the past year or two years? It's the same people, the same faces with no new blood. Well, it could be that you don't have a, an embracing attitude. It could be that your connection group, which is intended to be open, has become closed without you even realizing it. You know what will close your, you know what will close your connection group faster than anything? If you do not have an evangelizing attitude. Now, let me tell you something. If you're going to have an evangelizing attitude, then you better have an embracing attitude because you can't pick and choose who God sends to you. As a matter of fact, James rebukes that in James chapter 2. Listen to this verse in James chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. This is what James said. He says, for, for, for if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and you say to him, you sit over there or sit down by my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil motives? If you see a, a rich man and, and you give him all the attention and all the accolades and all the embracing, but then someone comes in and they're dirty, let me ask you a question. If somebody walked into your connection group this morning and they've got tattoos from head to toe, a mohawk, and piercings on every part of their body, how would you respond? Would you embrace them? Would they feel welcomed? They should. They should. And that's the point that we have to get to. And if your connection group is going to have that attitude, then you who are a part of that connection group first must have that attitude. So do you have an embracing attitude? No matter what they look like, no matter where they're from, I'm not going to show partiality. I'm not going to show favorites. I'm just going to love you in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen? We are all people created in the image of God. And we are to have an embracing attitude. Now, please understand me. I'm not talking about compromising truth. Do you understand that? I'm not talking about compromising truth. I'm not talking about condoning sinful behavior. I'm talking about, yes, standing for truth and we preach against immoral lifestyles, but at the same time, and especially the context of this verse is new, con new converts, by the way. Let's put this in, we're talking about when God sends new people to us, but not just new converts, but new people in general. Sometimes we're afraid to embrace people because we think if we embrace them, then we're condoning their lifestyle or we're, condo we're condoning a certain doctrinal belief. No, there's going to be a time. I'm going to embrace somebody so that I can earn the right to share the truth with them. I'm going to embrace somebody, not to condone their lifestyle, but because I love them and I want to see them out of that lifestyle. Embracing is not the end. Embracing is a, is a means to an end of seeing life transformation take place in that person. 
Isn't that what Jesus Christ was all about? Was transformation, bringing about transformation in people's lives? So the ultimate end is transformation. But what's the means to that end? Embracing. If you don't embrace people and love people, then we're not going to see people's lives transformed for the glory of God. So score yourself. Score yourself personally. Score your connection group. Number three, do you have an encouraging attitude? What did Barnabas do when he went to Antioch? The Bible says he encouraged him. Now, by the way, I'm going to point. I want you to look at this. Look at verse 23. It says, "When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he encouraged all of them to remain." Notice this. He remained all of them. He encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord, with a firm, resolute, of the heart. So notice this. The Bible says that Barnabas encouraged the new converts. And now notice the next verse. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit. What does God think about an encourager? A good man. So do you have an encouraging attitude? Do you have an encouraging attitude? I'm going to tell you something. The Lord, can I just be honest and say the Lord got up in my business this week as I was preparing this sermon because I had to score myself. I had to take this evaluation. I was doing good. You know what I was doing? I was thinking about, I, I had it in the perfect context. Me as a pastor. Oh, yeah, as a pastor, I do this pretty good. Evangelizing. Okay, I'll score. Uh, encouraging. Oh, yeah, I, I, I encourage people. And then the Holy Spirit of God said, Blake, why don't you stop evaluating yourself in your comfort zone and stop evaluating yourself in how you live in your house? Are you encouraging your children? Because I'll be real honest with you, I'm just like some of you. You work all day, you're tired, you're giving yourself out to people, you come home, kids are screaming, the last thing you want to do is say, speak life into them. There's that song on the Christian radio that speaks, it says, speak life, speak life, right? Speak life. Well, here's my version of that. If you don't stop doing that, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> so if you stop it, that means you're going to get life, Amen. And so, don't just evaluate yourself in your comfort zone. Think about, are you an encourager in your home? Are you an embracer in your home? Now think about your connection group. Would you characterize your connection group as a, having an encouraging attitude? Let, here's how you evaluate that. When's the last time you've gone over your roles to see who hasn't been here in a while and reached out and encouraged them? Where have you been? I just wanted to call and check on you, love on you, see, see, come by and see you, send you a card, call you on the phone. We want you to know you're missed. We want to encourage you. We want to encourage you just to remain faithful to your connection group because a part of a community, we, can, we need each other, right? Or does your connection group say, ah, those who want to be here will be here. Those who aren't here, they know where it's at. They probably just need to get saved. That's not very encouraging, is it? So do you have an encouraging attitude? Does your connection group have an encouraging attitude? Lastly, is do you have... Oh, it's not. I got two more. Man. Man. Do you have an empowering attitude? Where do we see the empowering attitude? Well, look at verse 26. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and they taught large numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Notice that for a whole year, Peter, I mean, Barnabas went and got Saul because he knew that it was more than he could handle. But not only that, because Saul was called to, to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And so he goes and he recruits Saul. And for an entire year, they teach these new converts. They gather them together in small group. Amen. And they teach them 
They disciple them from the Word of God. You know what they're doing? You know what they're doing? They're empowering them. Do you have an empowering attitude? Do you seek to help people to be better than who they are? Is it your desire to bring out the best in people? Are you empowering your children? How do I empower my children? By teaching them the Word of God and then giving them opportunity to serve. Do I have an empowering attitude in my, in my home where I'm setting up my children to succeed, where I'm setting them up to thrive, where I'm setting them up to be all they can be for the Lord? What about your connection group? Now score yourself in these areas. Now what about your connection group? Do you have an empowering attitude in your connection group? If you are not placing priority upon the teaching of the Word of God, then you do not have an empowering attitude. If the Word of God is just something that you get around to, if you have enough time in your class after you've done everything else, you've got a huge problem. Because God's people are empowered when they're taught and they're discipled from the Word of God. We are empowered when we gain wisdom. We are empowered when we gain knowledge. We are empowered when we are able to understand the Word of God. We are empowered when we are filled with the Spirit. And it is through the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God that the Spirit of God empowers us to do the work of the ministry. So do you have an empowering attitude? Personally, are you discipling someone? Do you have someone in your life that you're mentoring? You say, well, Pastor, God hasn't called me that. Listen, God's called all of us to that. Yours may not be in a, in a corporate setting such as this. But it could be in your home. It could be a grandchild. It could be a child. It could be a co-worker. But are you, do you have an empowering attitude? And then look at your connection group. Is your connection group empowering people? Is your connection group empowering people to grow in the Lord and to serve God? Or, is your, or has your connection group become more of a hindrance? Because people can come and be a part of a clique and not be challenged to do anything. Score yourself. Good speakers will tell you, throwing a joke at this point, everything's tense. Everybody's tense. Everything's so just throw a joke in to kind of loosen the mode. Right. I don't want. I don't want. I want you to be tense. Amen. I don't want to big hole the train right now. I want to leave the air pressure built up. Amen. For a little while. <laughs> An engaging attitude. Where do we see that? Starting in verse 27, what did the new converts do? They engaged in ministry. The new converts themselves took up a relief fund and sent it to the church at Jerusalem. They were engaged in ministry. So what about you? Do you have an engaging in a, a, a attitude? Are you involved in ministry? Are you involved in serving other people? What about your connection group? Is your connection group involved in serving and in helping the church fulfill its vision? Now I want you to look at this. The church had an evangelizing attitude. The church had an embracing attitude. The church had an encouraging attitude. The church had an empowering attitude. And the church had an engaging attitude. But here's the thing I want you to look at. Who were the ones engaging in ministry? The new converts. When we have the proper attitude, new converts get involved in ministry. That, my friend, is the health of the church. Why am I preaching this? Because I desire for us to be a healthy, thriving, growing church. And the only way we're going to be a healthy, thriving, growing church 
is that if we get the newly saved people involved in ministry, and what is our strategy? What is our strategy for getting them involved in ministry? Your connection group. Your connection group. Now, the highest possible score that you can have on your personal attitude is a 25. Now, if you scored a 25, I'd like for you to make your way down. Please come up here to the stage. And I'm going to... No, I'm teasing. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to call you to repentance right here in front of everybody for lying. The, 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 the total possible score altogether is a 50. You scored 50 on both. My, my, we get, that means you got a perfect. That means you're perfect and your connection group is perfect. But I, I got a feeling that there's not a perfect person in here, and, and I got a feeling there's not a perfect connection group in here. And so please understand the purpose of this evaluation was not to condemn us, but to help us to see where we need to grow. Maybe, you, maybe, you, you, maybe your connection group scored high in the area of evangelism, but low in the area of embracing. I mean, you get new people in there, but they don't stay. <laughs> well, that ought to tell you something. Why are they not staying? Or maybe you say, man, they're, they're coming, they're staying, but yet, we don't see them very often. Well, how encouraging are you? Are you encouraging them? Maybe you say, man, they're coming, they're staying. We're encouraging, but man, they're not, they're not growing. They're not growing. Then are you empowering them? You want to know whether or not it's you want to know whether or not your connection group is really healthy, really healthy. They're coming, they're staying, they're encouraged, they're growing, and they're serving. Right? The new, not only are those who have been here for a while serving, but the new people that God is adding to our number. They, too, are serving the Lord. They, too, are serving the Lord. Some helpful hints. Have a prayer list, personally. Have a prayer list of lost people that you're praying for. Pray over that daily. In your connection group, establish an outreach team, not just in name only in, or in theory, <laughs> but an outreach team that actually shows up, represents your class on, when we do outreach. You want to have more of an embracing attitude than on a weekly basis? Look for people you don't know. Meet new friends. Meet new people. Intentionally seek out people that you do not know. And you say, well, I'm afraid to meet someone because I may think they're a visitor, but in reality they've been going to church here 20 years. Okay, let's just get this out in the open. No wearing your feelings on your sleeve. If somebody comes to you and welcomes you here and you've been coming here for 20 years, just say, thank you, friend. Amen? Don't get all wadded up, right? Just say, thank you. So now you don't have to be afraid. Just walk up to everybody. Find people you don't know. Say, oh, thank you. I'm glad that you're here today. What's your name? Oh, my name's this. What do you do for a living? Are you a part of a connection group? Well, praise the Lord. Amen. And don't tell them if you've been coming here for 25 years because that'll keep them from doing it again, all right? Just say amen and shake your head like it's your first time. <laughs> Make sure your classroom is an inviting. It has an environment of inviting. Look at your classroom. Go into your classroom today I'm, and go in there with the eye, with the mindset that you're a new person. You're a new guest. You walk in. You know what you'll probably see? Everybody who knows each other already talking to each other. And they've already got their seats where they sit every Sunday. And they don't know whether you're a guest or not, and so they're afraid to ask you. So you just go out, you're on your own. You just sit down, and hopefully you'll find a place somewhere, and you'll probably not want to come back. 
So look at your class. Make sure it's inviting. Make sure there's an environment of invitation, a welcoming environment. You want to have an encouraging attitude? Call people. Write cards. Establish a ministry that reaches out to people. You want to have an empowering attitude? Then make sure that priority is being given to the teaching of the Word of God and not the latest football statistics. You want to have an engaging attitude? Then serve in your church. Establish a mission team. Develop mission projects. Now here's what I want you to see. Now this is what's cool. Then I'm done. Here's what I want you to see. And God did not show me this until after I'd prepared the sermon. Now the reason I'm telling you this is because I don't want you to think that I went into the sermon with this in mind. God revealed this to me after I had prepared the sermon. Are you looking at your notes? First of all, let me say our mission statement. We are a family of faith passionately connected to Christ, His church, His word, His mission for His glory. Now look at your notes. We are a family of faith passionately connected to Christ. Do you have an evangelizing attitude? Passionately connected not only to, to Christ, but to His church. Not only do we want to see people saved, we want to see them involved in church. Do you have an embracing and encouraging attitude? How do we get people involved in church? Not only do we evangelize, but we embrace and encourage. We want to connect people to Christ, we want to connect people to His church, and we want to connect people to His what? His Word. Do you have an empowering attitude? And we want to connect people to His mission for His glory. Do you have an engaging attitude? Notice that I had you evaluate two areas. And perhaps you're looking at that and you say, Pastor, but there's one missing. There's one missing. There's my personal life. There's our connection group. But what about the church? Shouldn't we be evaluating our church? There's two for a purpose. Because you need to evaluate your personal life. But your connection group is the church. And the attitude of your connection group is going to reflect the attitude of this church. So if we want an evangelizing, evangelizing, embracing, encouraging, empowering, engaging attitude in our church, then it needs to be in your connection group. And it needs to be in your life personally. So I pray that you'll take this evaluation and perhaps even go into your connection group and talk about it. What are some things that we can do better? What are some changes that I can make personally? And what are some things that we can do better in our connection group in order to help our church fulfill its vision? Because after all, our connection group, your connection group, is the strategy. If our groups fail, then we fail. I'm going to ask you if you would to bow your heads this morning in prayer. You've heard a lot this morning about evaluation, evaluating our attitude. But there's an evaluation that I would like for you to take right now, and that is the evaluation of your salvation. I want to ask you a very simple question. Are you saved? If you were to die today, do you have the assurance? I'm talking about the, the absolute assurance that you'd, be in the, that you'd be in heaven with Jesus. If you were to stand before God today and God said to you, why should I let you in? Do you have an answer? What would your answer be? Why should I let you into heaven? What's your answer? I want you to know this morning that you can have those questions answered 
if you will surrender your life to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you will acknowledge your sin before God, repent of your sin, surrender your life to Jesus, confess with your mouth that He is your Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Listen, don't leave here with doubt. The Lord wants us to know without a shadow of a doubt that we're saved. He told us in 1 John, I write these things so that you may know you have eternal life. If there's doubt, you need it removed. And one of the best ways to have it removed is to come and nail down your salvation this morning. Come and genuinely give your life to Jesus. This is no time for pride. This is no time for procrastination. This is no time for selfishness. This is a time for you to be obedient to God. If he is calling you to salvation, then you have no other response but yes, Lord, and you need to come. Any other response beyond that is disobedience. If the Lord is calling you to come and nail down your salvation, to come and to get right with him, the only response is a response of humility and immediate obedience. You come. Here in a moment, I'm going to ask everyone to stand, and I'll be down front. And for those of you who need to be saved, I want you to come. Don't let distance keep you from coming. You say, well, I'm in the balcony. It doesn't matter. You come. Walk up to myself or one of the other ministers and say, I need to be saved. I need to give my life to Jesus. I'm tired of doubting. I'm tired of not knowing. I want to nail it down. And then you come. Others of you this morning and you say, boy, I scored low, Pastor. Personally, my attitude stinks. Then friend, don't leave here discouraged. night a revival in you. Ask God to help you to change your attitude. I've already prayed that this week. Would you come this morning and pray for personal revival? Leave here encouraged. Maybe you'd just like to come and pray for your connection group. Maybe a connection group would like to come together. Just connection groups, just come and pray together. You say, well, I don't know where all my members are at. They're all scattered out across. Listen, if you see a few, just come. And maybe you'd like to pray for your connection group. You come. But let's respond to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray for a great outpouring of your spirit now. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and begin to come? Make your way. We.